The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke. Glory to you, o Lord. At that very hour, some Pharisees came and said to Jesus, Get away from here, for Herod wants to kill you. He said to them, Go and tell that fox for me. Listen, I am casting out demons and performing cures today and tomorrow, and on the third day I finish my work. Yet today, tomorrow, and the next day I must be on my way because it is impossible for a prophet to be killed outside of Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often have I desired to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings and you are not willing. See, your house is left to you. And I tell you, you will not see me until the time comes when you say, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. The Gospel of the Lord. Christ. Sisters and brothers in Christ, grace to you and peace in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Something doesn't add up here. Jesus' grief at the rejection of God's people is heartbreaking. But Jesus doesn't say they've rejected his teachings or his miracles or who he says he is. He says, how often have I longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers a brood under her wings and you were not willing. Jesus mourns that Jerusalem, standing for all of Israel, is rejecting Jesus' maternal love and therefore rejecting God's maternal love. And that doesn't make any sense. Who wouldn't want to be gathered into the wings of God, safe, beloved? Now, if we ask that, of what's happening in Jesus' time, we see that he was rejected for reasons he doesn't mention here. Jesus did a pretty good job of attracting many of those he wanted to bring in under his wings. The crowds that followed him loved him. He had much less success with the leaders of his people. They did reject his teachings such as the teaching that living in God's love is far more important than keeping one of God's laws if the two are in conflict, or the teaching that God was far more interested in a sinner who repented than folks who thought they were good enough they didn't need repentance. They rejected his behavior, especially the time that he spent with sinful people, prostitutes, tax collectors, poor and uneducated people, lepers. He even spoke publicly with women. These weren't the right people. They rejected his embrace because they rejected everything he stood for. If people listened to his teachings, lived as he lived, believed what he believed, their authority and power would be gone. So they even when they saw miracles right before their eyes opposed Jesus. Because he was enough of a threat to them, they couldn't see clearly. Now, this is becoming a nice little morality tale, and that's exceedingly dangerous. We comfortably talk about how bad the authorities were in Jesus' time, thinking, how could they have been that way? Glad that we're different. End of story, end of sermon. Be wary of that conclusion. Paul falls close to this problem today as well. Paul says that there are those who are enemies of the cross, whose God is the belly, and whose minds are fixed 
on earthly things. What Paul has done is what we just did with the authorities. He's gotten into we and they language. He would have done better to include himself and the Philippians amongst those who sometimes had their minds fixed on earthly things, whose God sometimes was the belly. And so could we. Such we and they language destroys honesty about your life and about your path and about yourself and covers it with lies. It keeps the truth at arm's length and applies it to someone else, which feels safe, but it's a false security. When you do that, you miss the truth about your path, about your prejudice, about your reality, and you miss the probability that you might be among those who are rejecting the embracing wings of Jesus. And if you miss that, you miss everything. Our problem is the same as the religious leaders. Notice the pattern in their rejection. It's the people Jesus embraces more than anything else that turns them away. Jesus' proclamation of God's love was unabashedly for all. Sinners, broken people, people who didn't darken the door of a synagogue, people who were unacceptable from their birth, women, non-Jews, even the hated Romans. Jesus welcomed and embraced them all. His teachings and his actions, and most deeply, his cross and resurrection were his embrace, his enfolding of all God's people under God's wing. And it's clear that some just couldn't handle how broad the category God's people really was. Jesus would say to Paul here, I know you think that these people are wrong, that their mind is fixed on earthly things, that they might even seem to be my enemies, but know this, I love them enough to die for them too. And this exposes a sensitive nerve in us. Just how anxious we are about who else is getting the invitation to be brought under God's embracing wings. To receive the embrace that God the mother hen so longs to place over the whole world. We don't want to share our space under God's wings with certain people any more than these authorities did. And Christians have always struggled with this. The history of Jesus' people is littered with bodies and lives of people Christians have deemed those people unacceptable, not welcome in God's embrace. From the Crusades to the Inquisition to Christian support of racism and slavery that exists to, the day, to this day, Christians have opposed Christ and placed people into groups labeling them. And when you do this, as Hitler taught us so well, you can reject with very little effort. If you think that God hates Muslims, you can easily conclude that you don't have to worry about how they're treated. If you think God rejects people who think or act in ways that offend you, you can easily believe that you don't have to have compassion for them. But if Jesus came and did his public ministry in person as he did 2,000 years ago, here today, he'd be welcoming folks that some of us would be very uncomfortable with. Maybe even people that we know really well. But when you close your heart to anyone, you close your heart to God's love. When you reject anyone whom God loves, you reject God. Now here's an interesting truth about chickens. Someone I knew who grew up on a farm once told me that what they would do is get brood hens to care and nurture for the baby chicks that they got from the hatchery. They would put them under their wings, they would care for them. But sometimes, 
the hens would not accept these unknown chicks. They'd ignore them. Then her father would take the handle end of a hammer and gently tap the hens on the head, briefly stunning them. <laughs> when they woke up, they'd see the very same chicks and think they were their own. <laughs> and they'd bring them in under their wings. Now, this flips the image from Jesus as hen to us as hen, but there's an important truth here. Maybe the love and grace of Jesus is your tap on the head. Paul says that we often set our minds on earthly things, not heavenly things. Rejecting people that we don't like or that we think think wrong or do anything else is definitely an earthly thing. The heavenly thing is to recognize that God's love is so astonishingly broad, God intends to welcome in the whole creation and all creatures. But something needs to wake you up to be able to see differently. We often deny God's love to others when we most have difficulty believing that we ourselves are loved by God. So if you've ever known the darkness of fear that you are not loved, if you've never felt or sometimes haven't felt certain that God really loves you, it is really hard to extend a love you don't feel you have to people you don't like or trust. Well, God loves you infinitely with a love that destroys death a love that looks at all your failure and pain, your sin and your bad thoughts, all of the things that you hope nobody knows about you, and sees only a beloved child of God who needs to be brought into God's embrace. Now, isn't that a tap on the head? So. Do you see others differently now? Enjoy your place under God's wings. They're there to support you and strengthen you for this hard life and prepare you with joy for the next. They're your shelter in a storm, your comfort in your pain, your warmth in your cold. But look around too, for certain, there are people under those wings that you don't like. And maybe they don't like you either. But those wings are for them as well as for you. Can you see that? It's part of the deal with God's love. And for that, you can give eternal thanks. In the name of Jesus, amen. amen.